The Passing of Sister Barset by Sarah Orn Jewett. Read by Frank Blissett. Mrs. Mercy Crane was of such firm persuasion that a house is meant to be lived in that during many years she was never known to leave her own neat two-storied dwelling place on the ridge road. Yet being very fond of company, in pleasant weather she often sat in the side doorway looking out on her green yard, where the grass grew short and thick, and was undisfigured even by a path toward the steps. All her faded green blinds were securely tied together and knotted on the inside by pieces of white tape. But now and then, when the sun was not too hot for her carpets, she opened one window at a time for a few hours, having pronounced views upon the necessity of light and air. Although Mrs. Crane was acknowledged by her best friends to be a peculiar person and very set in her ways, she was much respected and one acquaintance vied with another in making up for her melancholy seclusion by bringing her all the news they could gather. She had been left alone many years before by the sudden death of her husband from sunstroke, and though she was by no means poor, she had, as someone said, such a pretty way of taking a little present that you couldn't help being pleased when you gave her anything. For a lover of society, such a life must have had its difficulties at times, except that the ridge road was more travelled than any other in the township, and Mrs. Crane had invented a system of signals to which she always resorted in case of wishing to speak to some one of her neighbors. The afternoon was wearing late, one day toward the end of summer, and Mercy Crane sat in her doorway dressed in a favorite old-fashioned light calico and a small shoulder shawl figured with large palm leaves. She was making some tatting of a somewhat intricate pattern. She believed it to be the prettiest and most durable of trimmings, and having decorated her own wardrobe in the course of unlimited leisure, she was now making a few yards apiece for each of her more intimate friends, so that they might have something to remember her by. She kept glancing up the road as if she expected someone, but the time went slowly by, until at last a woman appeared to view, walking fast and carrying a large bundle in a checked handkerchief. Then Mercy Crane worked steadily for a short time without looking up, until the desired friend was crossing the grass between the dusty road and the steps. The visitor was out of breath, and did not respond to the polite greeting of her hostess until she had recovered herself to her satisfaction. Mrs. Crane made her the kind offer of a glass of water or a few peppermints, but was answered only by a shake of the head so she resumed her work for a time until the silence should be broken. "'I have come from the house of mourning,' said Sarah Ellen Dow at last, unexpectedly. "'You don't tell me that Sister Barset. She's left us this time. She's really gone.' And the excited news-bringer burst into tears. The poor soul was completely overwrought. She looked tired and wan, as if she had spent her forces in sympathy as well as hard work. She felt in her great bundle for a pocket handkerchief, but was not successful in the search, 
and finally produced a faded gingham apron with long, narrow strings, with which she hastily dried her tears. The sad news appealed also to Mercy Crane, who looked across to the apple trees and could not see them for a dazzle of tears in her own eyes. The spectacle of Sarah Ellen Dow going home with her humble workaday possessions from the house where she had gone in haste only a few days before to care for a sick person well known to them both was a very sad sight. You sent word yesterday that you should be returning early this afternoon and would stop. I presume I received the message as you gave it? asked Mrs. Crane, who was tenacious in such matters. But I do declare I never looked to hear she was gone. She's been failing right along since yesterday, about this time, said the nurse. She's taken no notice to speak of, and been eating the valley o' nothing, I may say, since I went there a Tuesday. Her sisters both come back yesterday, and of course I was expected to give up charge to them. They're used to sickness, and both having such a name for being great housekeepers. Sarah Ellen spoke with bitterness, but Mrs. Crane was reminded instantly of her own affairs. I feel condemned that I ain't begun my own fall cleaning yet she said, with an ostentatious sigh. "'Plenty of time to worry about that,' her friend hastened to console her. "'I do desire to have everything decent about my house,' resumed Mrs. Crane. "'There's nobody to do anything but me. If I was to be taken away sudden myself, I shouldn't want to have it said afterwards that there was wisps under my sophie, or— There, I can't dwell on my own troubles with Sister Barset's loss right before me. I can't seem to believe she's really passed away. She always was saying she should go in some of these spells, but I deemed her to be troubled with narves. Sarah Ellen Dow shook her head. I'm all nerved up myself, she said brokenly. I made light of her sickness when I went there first. I'd seen her what she called dreadful low so many times, but I saw her looks this morning, and I begun to believe her at last. Them sisters o' hers is a master of unfeeling hearts. Sister Barset was a layin there yesterday, and one of em was a settin right by her tellin how difficult twas for her to leave home. Her niece was goin to graduate to the high school, and they was goin to have a time in the evening, and all of the exercises promised to be extra interesting. Poor Sister Barset knew what she said and looked at her with contempt and then she give a glance at me and closed up her eyes as if twas for the last time. I know she felt it. Sarah Ellen Dow was more and more excited by a sense of bitter grievance. Her rule of the afflicted household had evidently been interfered with. She was not accustomed to be ignored and set aside at such times. Her simple nature and uncommon ability found satisfaction in the exercise of authority. But she had now left her post feeling hurt and wronged, besides knowing something of the pain of honest affliction. If it hadn't been for esteeming Sister Barset, as I always have done, I should have told him no, and held to it, when they asked me to come back and watch to-night. Taint for none of their sakes, but Sister Barset was a good friend to me in her way. Sarah Ellen broke down once more, and felt in her bundle again hastily, but the handkerchief was again elusive, 
while a small object fell out upon the doorstep with a bounce. "'Tain't nothing but a little taste cake I spared out of the loaf I baked this morning," she explained with a blush. I was so shoved out that I seemed to want to turn my hand to something useful and feel I was still doing for Sister Barset. Try a little piece, won't you, Miss Crane? I thought it seemed light and good. They shared the taste cake with serious enjoyment and pronounced it very good indeed when they had finished and shaken the crumbs out of their laps. There's nobody but you shall come and do for me at the last, if I can have my way about things, said Mercy Crane impulsively. She meant it for a tribute to Miss Dow's character and general ability, and as such it was meekly accepted. You're a younger person than I be, and less war, said Sarah Ellen but she felt better now that she had rested, and her conversational powers seemed to be refreshed by her share of the little cake. Dr. Bangs has behaved real pretty, I can say that, she continued presently in a mournful tone. Heretofore in the sickness of Sister Barset, I have always felt to hope certain that she would survive. She's recovered from a sight of things in her day. She has been the first to have all the new diseases that's visited this region. I know she had the spinal mergitis months before there was any other case about, observed Mrs. Crane with satisfaction. And the new throat troubles, all of them, agreed Sarah Ellen. Anne has made trial of all the best patent medicines, and could tell you their merits as no one else could in this vicinity. She never was one that depended on herbs alone, though she considered them extremely useful in some cases. Everybody has their herb, as we know, but I'm free to say that Sister Barset sometimes done everything she could to kill herself with such roving ways a dosin. She must see it now she's gone and can't stuff down no more invigorators. Sarah Ellen Dow burst out suddenly with this, as if she could no longer contain her honest opinion. There, there, you're all worked up answered placid Mercy Crane, looking more interested than ever. And she was dreadful handy to talk religion to other folks, but I've come to a realizing sense that religion is something besides opinions. She and Elder French has been mostly of one mind, but I don't know's they've got hold of all the religion there is. Why, why, Sarah Ellen! exclaimed Mrs. Crane, but there was still something in her tone that urged the speaker to further expression of her feelings. The good creature was much excited. Her face was clouded with disapproval. I ain't forgetting nothing about their good points, either, she went on in a more subdued tone and suddenly stopped. Preachin'll be done away with soon or late. Preachin' a elder French's kind, announced Mercy Crane, after waiting to see if her guest did not mean to say anything more. I should like to read em out that verse another fashion. Be ye doers o' the word, not preachers only, would hit it about right. But there, it's easy for all of us to talk. In my early days I used to like to get out to meet in regular, because sure as I didn't, I had bad luck all the week. I didn't feel pacified less I'd been half a day, but I was out all day the Sabbath before Mr. Barlow died as he did. So you mean to say that Sister Barset's really gone? 
Mrs. Crane's tone changed to one of real concern, and her manner indicated that she had put the preceding conversation behind her with decision. She was herself to the last, instantly responded Miss Dow. I see her put out a thumb and finger from under the spread and pinch up a fold of her sister Decket's dress to try and see if twas all wool. I thought twant all wool myself, and I know it now by the way she looked. She was a very knowing person about materials. We shall miss poor Miss Barset in many ways. She was always the one to consult with about matters of dress. She passed away easy at the last, I hope, asked Mrs. Crane with interest. Why, I want there, if you'll believe it, exclaimed Sarah Ellen, flushing and looking at her friend for sympathy. Sister Barset revived up the first of the afternoon, and they sent for Elder French. She took notice of him, and he exhorted quite a spell, and then he spoke of there being need of air in the room, Miss Deckett having closed every window, and she asked me of all folks if I hadn't better step out. But Elder French come too, and he was very reasonable, and had a word with me about Miss Deckett and Miss Peek, and the way they was working things. I told him right out how they never come near when the rest of us was having it so hard with her along in the spring, but now they thought she was really going to die, they come settling down like a pair of old crows in a field to pick for what they could get. I just made up my mind they should have all the care if they wanted it. It didn't seem as if there was anything more I could do for Sister Barset, and I sat there in the kitchen within call and waited, and when I heard him saying, There, she's gone, she's gone, and Miss Deckett a weepin', I put on my bonnet and stepped myself out into the road. I felt to repent after I had gone but a rod, but I was so worked up, and I thought they'd call me back, and then I was put out because they didn't, and so here I be. I can't help it now. Sarah Ellen was crying again. She and Mrs. Crane could not look at each other. Well, you set and rest said Mrs. Crane kindly, and with the merest shadow of disapproval. You set and rest, and by and by, if you'd feel better, you could go back and just make a little stop and inquire about the arrangements. I wouldn't harbor no feelings if they be inconsiderate folks. Sister Barset has often deplored their actions in my hearing and wished she had sisters like other folks. With all her faults, she was a useful person and a good neighbor, mourned Mercy Crane sincerely. She was one that always had something interesting to tell, and if it wa'n't for her dying spells and all that sort of nonsense, She'd make a figure in the world, she would so. She walked with an air always, Miss Barset did. You'd ask who she was if you hadn't known, as she passed you by. How quick we forget the outs about anybody that's gone. But I always feel grateful to anybody that's friendly, situated as I be. I shall miss her running over. I can seem to see her now, coming over the rise in the road. But don't you get in a way of taking things too hard, Sarah Allen. You've worked yourself all to pieces since I saw you last. You're getting to be as lean as a meetin' house fly. Now you're coming in to have a cup of tea with me, and then you'll feel better. I've got some new molasses gingerbread that I baked this morning. I do feel beat out, Miss Crane, 
acknowledged the poor little soul, glad of a chance to speak, but touched by this unexpected mark of consideration. If I could have done as I wanted to, I should be feeling well enough, but to be set aside and ordered about, where I'd taken the lead in sickness so much, and knew how to deal with Sister Barset so well, she might be living now, perhaps. Come, we'd better go in, tis getting damp. And the mistress of the house rose so hurriedly as to seem bustling. Don't dwell on Sister Barset and her foolish folks no more. I wouldn't, if I was you. They went into the front room, which was dim with the twilight of the half-closed blinds and two great syringa bushes that grew against them. Sarah Ellen put down her bundle and bestowed herself in the large, cane-seated rocking chair. Mrs. Crane directed her to stay there a while and rest, and then come out into the kitchen when she got ready. A cheerful clatter of dishes was heard at once upon Mrs. Crane's disappearance. I hope she's going to make one o' her nice short cakes, but I don't know she'll think it quite worth while, thought the guest humbly. She desired to go out into the kitchen, but it was proper behavior to wait until she should be called. Mercy Crane was not a person with whom one could venture to take liberties. Presently Sarah Ellen began to feel better. She did not often find such a quiet place or the quarter of an hour of idleness in which to enjoy it, and was glad to make the most of this opportunity. Just now she felt tired and lonely. She was a busy, unselfish, eager-minded creature by nature, but now, while grief was sometimes uppermost in her mind and sometimes a sense of wrong, every moment found her more peaceful, and the great excitement little by little faded away. What a person poor Sister Barset was to dread growing old so she couldn't get about. I'm sure I shall miss her as much as anybody, said Mrs. Crane, suddenly opening the kitchen door and letting in an unmistakable and delicious odor of shortcake that revived still more the drooping spirits of her guest. And a good deal of knowledge has died with her, she added, coming into the room and seeming to make it lighter. There she knew a good deal, but she didn't know all, especially o' doctorin', insisted Sarah Ellen from the rocking chair with an unexpected little laugh. She used to lay down the law to me as if I had neither sense nor experience, but when it came to her bad spells she'd always send for me. It takes everybody to know everything, but Sister Barset was of an opinion that her information was sufficient for the town. She was telling me the day I went there how she disliked to have old Miss Doubleday come and visit with her, and remarked that she called Miss Doubleday very officious. Went right down on her knees and prayed, says she. Anybody would have thought I was a heathen. But I kind of pacified her feelings and told her I supposed the old lady meant well. Did she give away any of her things, Miss Barset, I mean? inquired Mrs. Crane. Not in my hearing, replied Sarah Ellen Dow. Except one day, the first of the week, she told her oldest sister, Miss Deckett, twas the first day she rode over, that she might have her green quilted petticoat. You see, it was a rainy day, and Miss Deckett had complained of feeling thin. 
She went right up and got it, and put it on and wore it off, and I'm sure I thought no more about it until I heard Sister Barset groan and dreadful in the night. I got right up to see what the matter was, and what do you think but she was wanting that petticoat back, and not thinking any too well o Nancy Deckett for taking it when twas offered. Nancy never showed no sense of propriety, says Sister Barset. I just wish you'd hear her go on. If she had felt to remember me, continued Sarah Allen, after they had laughed a little, I'd full as soon have some of her nice crockery wear. She told me once, years ago, when I was stopping to tea with her and we were having it real friendly, that she should leave me her Britannia tea set. But I ain't got it in writing, and I can't say she's ever referred to the matter since. It ain't as if I had a home of my own to keep it in, but I should have thought a great deal of it for her sake. And the speaker's voice faltered. I must say that with all her virtues, she never was a first-class housekeeper, but I wouldn't say it to any but a friend. You never eat no preserves o' hers that one commence to work, and you know as well as I how little forethought she had about putting away her woolens. I sat behind her once in meetin when I was stoppin with the Tremlets, and so occupied a seat in their pew, and I see between ten and a dozen moth millers come workin out o' her fitch for tippet. They was flutterin round her bonnet same's twas a lamp. I should be mortified to death to have such a thing happen to me. Every housekeeper has her weak point. I've got mine as much as anybody else, acknowledged Mercy Crane with spirit. But you never see no moth millers come workin out o' me in a public place. Ain't your oven beginnin to get over hat? anxiously inquired Sarah Allen Dow, who was sitting more in the draught, and could not bear to have any accident happen to the supper. Mrs. Crane flew to a short cake's rescue, and presently called her guest to the table. The two women sat down to deep and brimming cups of tea. Sarah Allen noticed with great gratification that her hostess had put on two of the best teacups and some citron melon preserves. It was not an everyday supper. She was used to hard fare, poor hard-working Sarah Allen, and this handsome social attention did her good. Sister Crane rarely entertained a friend, and it would be a pleasure to speak of the tea-drinking for weeks to come. "'You've put yourself out quite a considerable for me,' she acknowledged. "'How pretty these cups is! You oughtn't to use em so common as for me. I wish I had a home I could really call my own to ask you to,' but tain't never been so I could. Sometimes I wonder what's going to become o' me when I get so I'm past work, taking care o' sick folks and being in houses where there's a sight going on and everybody's in a hurry kind o' wears on me now I'm most a-gettin' in years. I was wishin' the other day that I could get with some comfortable kind of a sick person where I could live right along quiet as other folks do, but folks never sends for me lest they're drove to it. I ain't laid up anything to really depend upon. The situation appealed to Mercy Crane well-to-do as she was, and not burdened with responsibilities. She stirred uneasily in her chair, but could not bring herself to the point of offering Sarah Allen the home she coveted. "'Have some hot tea,' 
she insisted in a matter-of-fact tone, and Sarah Allen's face, which had been lighted by a sudden eager hopefulness, grew dull and narrow again. Plenty, plenty, Miss Crane, she said sadly. Tis beautiful tea. You always have good tea. But she could not turn her thoughts from her own uncertain future. None of our folks has ever lived to be a burden, she said presently in a pathetic tone, putting down her cup. My mother was thought to be doing well until four o'clock and was dead at ten. My Aunt Nancy came to our house well at twelve o'clock and died that afternoon. My father was sick but ten days. There was dear sister Betsy. She did go in consumption, but twant an expensive sickness. I've thought sometimes about you, how you'd get past roving from house to house one of these days. I guess your friends will stand by you. Mrs. Crane spoke with unwanted sympathy, and Sarah Ellen's heart leaped with joy. You're real kind, she said simply. There's nobody I set so much by. But I shall miss Sister Barset when all is said and done. She asked me many a time to stop with her when I wasn't doing nothing. We all have our failings, but she was a friendly creature. I shan't want to see her laid away. Yes, I was thinking a few minutes ago that I shouldn't want to look out and see the funeral go by. She's one of the old neighbors. I suppose I shall have to look, or I shouldn't feel right afterward, said Mrs. Crane mournfully. If I hadn't got so kind of housebound, she added with touching frankness, I'd just as soon go over with you and offer to watch this night. "'Twould astonish Sister Barset, so I don't know, but she'd return. Sarah Ellen's eyes danced with amusement. She could not resist her own joke, and Mercy Crane herself had to smile. "'Now I must be going, or twill be dark,' said the guest, rising and sighing after she had eaten her last crumb of gingerbread. Yes, thank ye, you're real good. I will come back if I find I ain't wanted. Look what a pretty sky there is. And the two friends went to the side door and stood together in a moment of affectionate silence, looking out toward the sunset across the wide fields. The country was still with that deep, rural stillness which seems to mean the absence of humanity. Only the thrushes were singing far away in the walnut woods beyond the orchard, and some crows were flying over and cawed once loudly, as if they were speaking to the woman at the door. Just as the friends were parting, after most grateful acknowledgments from Sarah Ellen Dow, someone came driving along the road in a hurry and stopped. "'Who's that with you, Miss Crane?' called one of their near neighbors. "'It's Sarah Ellen Dow,' answered Mrs. Crane. "'What's the matter?' I thought so, but I couldn't rightly see. Come, there in a peck of trouble up to Sister Barsett's, wondering where you be, grumbled the man. They can't do nothing with her. She's drove off everybody and keeps us screeching for you. Come, step along, Sarah Ellen, do. Sister Barsett, exclaimed both the women. Mercy Crane sank down upon the doorstep, 
But Sarah Ellen stepped out upon the grass all of a tremble, and went toward the wagon. They said this afternoon that Sister Barset was gone, she managed to say. What did they mean? Gone where? asked the impatient neighbor. I expect twas one of her spells. She's come too. They say she wants something hearty for her tea. Nobody can't take one step till you get there neither. Sarah Ellen was still dazed. She returned to the doorway where Mercy Crane sat shaking with laughter. I don't know, but we might as well laugh as cry, she said in an aimless sort of way. I know you too well to think you're going to repeat a single word. Well, I'll get my bonnet and start. I expect I've got considerable to cope with, but I'm well rested. Good night, Miss Crane. I certain did have a beautiful tea, whatever the future may have in store. She wore a solemn expression as she mounted into the wagon in haste and departed. But she was far out of sight when Mercy Crane stopped laughing and went into the house. That was The Passing of Sister Barset by Sarah Orne Jewett Read by Frank Blissett